I think God's design for marriage is to glorify Him and to encourage His uh, spirit to live fully in each other. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who was actually in the arena, whose face is marked by dust and sweat and blood. Welcome to the Men in the Arena podcast, where we interview specialists in the realm of manhood. Each of our guests is an expert in their chosen field or cause as it relates to men. Our conviction is to call you into the arena of manhood, call you out of the faceless, nameless bleachers, and call you up to be the best version of you. Because when a man gets it, everyone wins. Enjoy today's episode. Men in the Arena Army, we salute you. Wow. As you noticed, I do not have Dale Culver with me in the studio today, but my beautiful wife, Shanna, and we are in sync as ever because we have the perfect marriage. Anyway, we're here today. I'm super excited to have my wife in here today. This is a really unique podcast because not only am I here with my wife and I, but I'm also here with some uh, friends that go way back 20 years. We used to attend their family camp on Catalina Island, Paul and Virginia Friesen. And I'm really excited to have them on. If you remember, Paul was on episode 297 when we interviewed him about his outstanding book on marriage called Loving Your Wife Like Christ When You Ain't No Jesus. <laughs> so we had a great time there. And so we brought them back on. And Paul had a great idea of doing an interview with our wives. And so I want to introduce you to them briefly. But first, let me share a little bit about them. So Paul and Virginia Friesen live in Bedford, Massachusetts. They've been married almost 45 Woo! years. They've been serving in marriage and family ministries for more than 40 years through family camps, church positions, speaking, consulting, and writing. In 2003, they founded Home Improvement Ministries with a mission to encourage healthy marriages and families to live out God's design. They speak at marriage and family conferences. They actually lead a Bible study with some New England Patriots couples. And Virginia also leads a Bible study with several of the wives and girlfriends of New England Patriots. So we're excited together. They've authored more than a dozen books and curriculums on parenting and marriage, including the topic for today, the marriage app. So excited to have Paul and Virginia on the show, as well as my beautiful wife, Shanna. Paul and Virginia, how are you guys doing? We're doing well. Thanks so much, Jim, Shanna. So glad to have you on. Uh, already looks so much better than the last time when I was just looking at Jim the whole time. <laughs> oh, hey I, hey, I feel the same way. <laughs> it is, it's actually just a great honor to be with you, and we're so excited to be able to just encourage marriages today because the men in the arena, that is such a critical area, what you're doing in ministry. There is another part to this whole um, plan of God. So we're excited to dive into that with you today. Wow. And so, honey, it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing? You are the you are the beauty behind the beast. Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna let Paul and Virginia interview us about their book, The Marriage App. So they're gonna ask us questions. So you need to make sure and lie a lot okay. for our <laughs> listeners. Okay. <laughs> We're really good about covering up and hiding and putting up veneers up about our marriage, so everything looks perfect. Fake news. Fake news. So, uh, <laughs> hey, <laughs> so Paul and Virginia, I'm really excited about this book, The Marriage App, and I love your style of writing. It's so practical. So, thanks so much for coming on our show, and uh, I'm excited to have you guys on. So, The Marriage App. Why? Why did you guys write this book? What What's behind the title? What's behind the reason? You know, it's interesting, Jim, uh, that wasn't the original uh, title. The original title was Unlocking the Irony of Intimacy. And uh, we had uh, asked Elizabeth um, Hasselbeck, who wrote the foreword, looked at the book and she said, and the cover, and she said, so this is a book just for Christians. You don't want anybody who isn't a Christ follower to read it. And we said, no. And she said, well, the title, nobody's going to open it. And uh, I said, well, it really is for Christians. And she said, so you've made the decision already that nobody should read it unless they're a Christian. And she sort of dressed us down very politely. And she said, hey, would you mind if I gave a shot at sketching out a title and a cover? And that's where it started. Wow. 
That is so cool. Well, you know, the marriage app is really a play on words because you actually ask couples to do application assignments at the end of each chapter. So when I opened the book and read that, I went, ah, now I get it. So I really do appreciate the title and an opportunity to to work through this together with my wife live on this podcast. So are you guys ready to uh, put us up on Front Street? We are. Let me just add before we dive into it that part of the impetus behind writing it is as marriage counselors, we just deal with couples every single week who have been married anywhere from six months to 50 years. And there is a recurrent theme of a lack of understanding of God's great design for marriage. I think it's been so lost over these last decades of marriages that have collapsed, of us moving away from God's design, both on a societal level and quite honestly, even within the church, that we feel most couples getting married are sort of shooting into the dark. They don't even know what they're going for. And so this really is kind of just a primer. It's a basic understanding of God's design for marriage. So in one sentence, would you be able to share what that design is? I think God's design for marriage is to glorify him and to encourage his uh, spirit to live fully in each other. Oh, that's really good. I appreciate that. Well, you know, it's interesting. I get reading these books and I dive headlong into them and I'm not a details person. So I'm, I'm reading through the book and I, why are you shaking your head? <laughs> anyway, yeah. thank you. We do agree. Okay. So I'm reading through the book and I'm, I keep highlighting at the end of each chapter, I keep finding this quote and I keep highlighting it. I'm like, this is so good. This is so good. I get eight chapters in and I get to this quote at the end of this chapter and I go, wait, I've seen this before. And I realized that you wrote the same quote at the end of each chapter. It only took me eight out of 10 to figure it out. So let me, let me read, let me, let me read the quote. It's embarrassing, but it's true. Let me read the quote to you. I want you to explain why the repetitive nature of this quote throughout the book. And here's the quote. And this may be the impetus of the book. When we put our spouse's needs above our own, not only do they feel loved, but it will propel our marriage towards greater intimacy. Thoughts? Well, absolutely. Um, we've already counseled a number of couples uh, here where we are. We're actually on Hawaii, the island of Hawaii, suffering for Jesus for a few weeks doing marriage counseling. And uh, already the issue of selfishness has been uh, repeated over and over again. And even last night, a gentleman said, of course, I love my wife like Christ. But then he went on to talk about everything that was about himself. And uh, it was clearly not putting her needs above his own. Yeah, and I would just add that we live in a culture that reinforces our broken nature, which is that life is about me and getting what I want is my inalienable right and whatever it takes to get that. It's okay. So selfishness, we think if you distill all of the issues of marriage, ultimately at the core, there is going to be that root of selfishness. Like it's, it's about me, it's for me. So that not only comes from a culture that reinforces that, but that's already inside of us. So as a result, marriages really suffer. They never become what God has designed them to become if we're each independently living for ourselves. And the irony in that is when I put Virginia's interests ahead of myself uh, and she feels loved, she treats me really well. And when I'm treated well by Virginia, I want to treat her well. So it spirals up. And we talk about it specifically in the chapter of love and respect. But when, when I feel respected by Virginia, I want to love her well. When I love her well, she respects me and treats me better. And uh, we do really well. Yeah, Emerson Egrets in his book, Love and Respect, calls that the crazy cycle. When we don't do that, I don't love her. She doesn't respect me, and it's this crazy cycle. And so, you know, I got to tell you guys, so I married I married a dream. I married an angel, and I woke up about a month later with Satan. And she married her dream man, and she woke up at a night. We had a horrible, horrible, 
say that's true. First year and a half of marriage. I wouldn't say it was horrible. I would say it was extremely challenging. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was challenging to the point of I was praying that God would take her out because I knew divorce was not an option. I mean, I just <laughs> I just thought I made the biggest mistake of my life. And and I went to an actual Promise Keepers event in 1995. And a pe- preacher kept repeating the same phrase over and o- over again, and it bored me to death. But the phrase was, you got to out love and out serve your wife. Mm-hmm. And probably about the hundredth time he said it, God spoke to my heart and God said, you need to out love and out serve her. Mm-hmm. And so that was that dispelling of selfishness. Mm-hmm. Really, I would say that was a, a turning point turning point in our marriage. And mm-hmm. so uh, it, it, and, uh, and uh, when I default into that selfish mode, it really, really hurts our marriage and the same with her. So I really do appreciate that so much. So I want to jump into your chapters and each title really just tells listeners and readers what they should do. So I'm going to jump into the chapter and I'm going to let you talk about it a little bit and I'm going to have you guys give us an application and Shanna and I are going to go through each application live so our listeners can go, oh, wow, okay, now I know these guys. So chapter one is simply titled Care for the one you love. And you wrote this. We are truly designed to be our best when we put our spouse's needs above our own. The irony is that when we do, we actually find the intimacy we've been longing for, which you've already said that. Do you want to uh, uh, build on that a little bit? Well, you know, it's interesting. We start the uh, the book with an illustration, which actually took place uh, on the island of Kauai here. Uh, Wendy and John had been married for, uh, goodness, how long? Over 40 years. 40 years. And John had suffered with cancer for the last 17 years. And when he passed, uh, Wendy asked us to come to, to Hawaii with her. And, you know, we were willing to suffer and do that. And here we are. And so we're on Hawaii with her for the first time since John passed. And she's overlooking the Pacific and she starts crying and we thought probably she's thinking of something, you know, a memorable time with him. And she says, we said, Wendy, what is it? And she said, I wish I'd made him more jello. And we said, you wish you'd made him more jello. And then she starts laughing and crying and saying, John loved jello, but I didn't like it. And I thought it was a waste of calories, food coloring. I would never make it for him. And John would bring home Jello, and we have a cupboard full of Jello now. I wish I'd made him more Jello. And you know, we've used that uh, as such an illustration that someday, we're unless we both go down in the plane at the same time, one of us is going to out the live of the other, and we'll guarantee we're going to say, "I wish I had. Hmm. I wish I had taken longer walks. I wish we had talked." I wish uh, I had made love more often. I wish I had been in the jacuzzi more. Uh, If we're going to say it someday, why don't we do it now and reap the benefits of loving each other well? Shanna's thinking, I wish he bought me more personal. No. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. sorry. So do you have an application for us that you'd like us to try uh, with our listeners? So go on a date this month to a place you used to go to or to an, doing an activity that you used to enjoy together. And while you're on that date, share your list of what attracted you to each other. Be sure that you keep this positive. Don't add, but boy, that was a pipe dream or things sure have changed since then. Or you never do that anymore. Just focus on what drew you to one another. Well, I know it was my tight Wranglers and my T-shirt with rolled up sleeves. So. <laughs> So do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? <laughs> do you want me to go first or do you want to go first? Uh, go ahead. Okay, so th- so besides your beauty, I would say you are one of the strongest people I've ever met. And uh, you are viciously loyal. You were in eight weddings in the first two years we were married. You were a loyal friend. You're a loyal wife. And you've got a uh, holiness and a resolve about your faith that you are just unbending. And so those are probably my top three things. Um, I think for me would be uh, for then it was his passion for ministry, whether that be, you know, the teens. He was just extremely faithful to his job. Um, He had a close family. Um, That was important to me. Um, And he seemed fun at the time. (laughs) 
Wow. Things have changed. <laughs> now I'm called the fun sucker. <laughs> oh, how funny. That's funny. Okay. Well, that's great. So so that I think that's really positive. Virginia, you want to add something? I was just going to say, Shannon, you did a very good job of stopping before saying, but boy, have things changed. <laughs> He said it, not me. Oh, <laughs> man. I, I know my own problems. I know my infirmity. Okay, so chapter two. So chapter one is care for the one you love, you know, and, and dispelling the selfishness. I appreciate that. Chapter two is have realistic expectations. And I think we live in a day and age like none other that, that uh, unrealistic expectations are put on people because of social media and images and these types of things. So what are your thoughts about this chapter when you wrote it what was the what was the purpose behind it well we come into marriage with all these expectations that come from our family of origin uh, media friends uh, all these things and one of the phrases that's been helpful to us is the difference between your expectation and your experience equals your level of satisfaction so if you have an expectation that your husband will be home every dinner night for dinner and he'll do the dishes, but he doesn't, then your level of satisfaction is going to be low. If you didn't expect him to fix dinner and do the dishes and he doesn't, then your level of satisfaction will be high because you never expected that in the first place. And it's often we come into marriage with unspoken expectations. Sometimes we don't even realize what they are. Yeah, we think that you have some expectations that are clear to you, and you've even actually talked about them. But to be honest, we think there are far more that are submerged beneath the level, and you're not even really aware of them. For instance, I, we were both raised in Christian homes, so our view of what a godly Christian husband and um, wife were really shaped by our own families. Because my father was a very hands-on, fix-it man, and he was the most godly man I knew, highly disciplined. I just assumed that since I was marrying a godly Christian man whom I respected the most of any man I'd ever dated, I just assumed that he would be able to fix whatever broke around our house, for instance. My father even tuned up our cars. So for our first married Christmas, I bought Paul a set of tools so that he could tune up our cars. When he opened them, he sort of looked at them like, what are these for? Virginia found out very quickly that it costs more to fix the car after I'd worked on it than before I worked on it. I have no mechanical ability whatsoever, but it is just hard for her to conceive that we would call somebody to fix our washer because dad does that and you're a man, you should do it, but it's not who I am. So that was a level of uh, dissatisfaction when we were early, uh, early in our marriage. So we think in the first years of marriage, you're really sorting out your expectations and landing them in one of three places. One is this actually is a realistic expectation, which we believe should be set by scriptural prescriptives. The second is these are completely unrealistic expectations. So you kind of need to just put them to death. And then there's this third set that well, this might become something that is a part of our life, but don't hang your hat on it. And the more conversation you have about that, the more you're willing to let go of things that truly land in the place that this is just unrealistic. It's not going to happen. So quit beating this dead horse. Your marriage is going to be able to move ahead. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful. So is there anything in our marriage that we did not discuss with each other beforehand? that you would say? No, I felt like we left everything on the table, but that's all fine and dandy when it's words. You're not living out that reality till you're actually living out that reality. Well, there were certain things that I expected that you would cook all my meals. Oh, yeah. And I walked in the house our, after our honeymoon. I said, what's for dinner? And she goes, I don't know. I don't cook. I go, you don't cook? <laughs> why, why did I marry you? <laughs> You know, I've cooked virtually every meal that we've been married and I can't fix a thing. I mean, I mean, my passwords are like have to do with words like breaking, crushing, beating, because because I destroy <laughs> things. I can't 
And you, you said this, you said this, I want to ask you about this. In chapter two, you said God's plan is designed to give us all this and more. His plan is perfect and cannot be improved upon. And yet, for many, such intimacy is elusive and their marriage is failing miserably in delivering what they were hoping for. Is this because of these unrealistic expectations? I think many of them are, again, because then our level of satisfaction is low. Um, We were talking to a couple last night, and he said, we have not been physically intimate in six years. And, you know, she said, because of how you treat me, you treat me so poorly. And so the expectation, which is a realistic one, that he should be kind to her, that she should be physically involved with him, had eluded them. Uh, because they had not been following God's design. But I'm just going to add that I think the biggest unrealistic expectation that probably everybody comes into marriage with is that somehow their mate is capable of meeting their deepest needs. That as long as their mate does what they're supposed to do, they're going to be golden. But this is what is true from Scripture, that ultimately there are parts of me that can only be met by God himself. Because if all of my needs could be met by Paul, I would actually have no need for God. But since I was made for him first, if I demand that Paul be everything to me, I will be disappointed and make our life miserable. And I'll really miss what God has for me, which is a deeply intimate relationship with him first, which is actually what makes me much more able to receive what he's designed for me to receive in this marriage. Which really goes back to chapter one, care for the one you love and get rid of selfishness, right? So that's really good. So you had several applications at the end of chapter two. Do you have one you would like to uh, pick for Shanna and I? Sure. Let's say um, do one thing each day to let your spouse know you love and appreciate them. It could be a note, flowers, gift, or a specific act of kindness that they would appreciate. Can you guys each think of something you would want to do that would communicate your love in a practical way? You know, it would be fun. Let's see if there's something we've done that we can articulate. So I'll start. So, you know, my executive assistant had a baby and quit. And I know you have a full-time job and I know it's really hard for you, but you came to work for me to help me. And I know it's been uh, hard. (laughs) And so I really appreciate it stepped up and you've decided to sacrifice for me. So I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Do you have one for me? Yeah. So um, for my job right now, I'm on what they call reserve. And so that means that on my shifts, I am on call. I don't know what I, where I'm going or what I'm doing. And yesterday was the last day of my, what they call block, my schedule. And I kind of didn't think I was, I, I've been, t- I'm tired. I've been flying a lot lately. And so I was just kind of thinking I was going to get to stay home and get paid, but that didn't happen. And I was kind of a hot mess yesterday because it ended up being another like 12 hour day. And I was zooming to my car last night at about 10, 10, 10, 10 30. And I'm in this long hallway by myself. It's inside. It's secure. But I see this guy like sitting on a bench and nobody is ever sitting on this bench. And so I, I'm walking because I'm wanting to get home. It takes me over an hour to get home. And this man says, hi. And I'm like, hi. I don't know who they are. They have a mask. They have a hat. I, I keep walking and he pulls down his mask. It was Jim. He surprised me and picked me up and took me home. So oh, no. up to say hi because I would have left him high and dry at the airport. <laughs> yeah, I almost missed him. I was like, if I would have five seconds later, I would have been walking home because my it was an hour drive just to get me there, and my youngest son dropped me off. Oh. So that's funny. So okay, well let's uh, let's. Uh, <laughs> so it was just nice. It was a nice. I didn't have to think about my drive home. I just got to. Because I, I was pretty bummed yesterday. So it was nice. Yeah, she's really tough. She left crying. I knew that was a problem. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's a great example of knowing each other, that Jim knew that would mean something to you and uh, yeah. making a lot of effort 
because we make a statement somewhere in the book that uh, love is not about logic, uh, because logically that made no sense. It took time, no. it took expense, everything, but that wasn't the issue. The issue was Jim knew you would feel loved, so he did that. That's a kudos to you, Jim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder how much of it had to do with him being able to answer that on the podcast today. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh oh that hurt how did i i did not prep you for that at all that was that's horrible I'm just we, usually, <laughs> we usually find couples do really nice things a couple days before our appointment so that made me <laughs> oh well now i actually flew all the way to seattle one day picked her up at midnight and drove her all the way home at five in the morning. We got home and I didn't know I was on a podcast. I so know. Her job just, her job pushes her to the limit sometimes. And so sometimes I feel like I need to step in just to, to he's, give her some hope. He's so. rescued me quite a bit. I would not have continued this job if I did not have his support. So, okay. So let's go to chapter three. So chapter three is simply titled appreciate your differences. And so I really did love this chapter and I can hear your voice in this chapter, Virginia. Do you want to speak to it? <laughs> yeah, this chapter focuses on the different ways that God has wired us on purpose. We often say when we teach on temperaments that if God had wanted us to all view life in the same way, to do life in the same way, he would have made us the same way. But he made us different on purpose. And again, humanity is a reflection of the Godhead, the difference of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They all have one purpose. They're unified in that, but they each have different roles and different functions. They operate differently. And that is true for us as people. It's often said that opposites attract, but then they attack. And I think that is really true when it comes to our temperament differences that we even subconsciously often recognize that the other person brings something into our life that we need that's different than us. And that's attractive to us and it draws us to them. But then we get married, and in the dailiness of marriage, those differences often really are disturbing, or we find them irritating, or we, we would default to thinking, mm -hmm. if only they could do it the right way, and you realize that the right way is the way that I think it should be done. So for us, we didn't recognize the differences in our temperaments at all when we got married almost 45 years ago, and we actually thought that we would have the smoothest, easiest two peas in the pod marriage that ever was made. And then we started living together after we got married. And I found that Paul felt that dressers and closets were unnecessary because he had a floor. I they are. I mean, why not just shed your clothes and leave them on the floor? Well, I think it's more practical because, that way. <laughs> it, it, you know, you wear clothes and they're not really dirty, so you don't want to wash them but they're not clean. So you don't want to hang them up. So you drop them on the floor and that you come in the next day and you say, I need something partially dirty. There it is. It's so practical. <laughs> so clearly Virginia married a sanguine. <laughs> <laughs> or a slob. One of the two. Sorry. But... <laughs> oh, well, you know, it's really. <laughs> I was just so unused to that because my, what I didn't say about my father was that he was an admiral in the Navy so we lived kind of ship shape at home and I watched my father. He would never leave a piece of clothing on the floor. He always put things back where they would, where they belonged. So I just wasn't expecting that a godly Christian man would be so completely bereft of such necessary character qualities. And it created a little bit of a crisis for me. Like I felt like there was bait and switch somewhere along the line until we understood that our temperaments were just very different. And part of what I loved about Paul is he's an extremely gifted visionary. He sees things that no one else sees. All of our books, all of our curriculums, all of our those things are the result of his visionary gifts. I could never have come up with that. So over the years, we really learned to appreciate the differences. And we decided that those differences were going to make us better rather than bitter. Oh, that's good. I really Another one of our big temperament differences comes in just keeping order in the home. I'm a person who believes that everything in a home has a home and it should be in that home unless you're using it. And then when you're done using it, you put it back where it belongs. 
To me, that's how God expects the universe to operate. I had no idea that I was married to a man who believes that everything is homeless. And wherever he last used it is its new temporary home. And it actually should be there when he goes to find it. But it isn't because I put it back where it belongs. And I'll hear, Bud, what happened to the, the hammer? I left it right here. And I'll say, no, I put it back where it goes. And he looks genuinely mystified and says, it goes somewhere? <laughs> like the thought never occurred to him. So when I come home, when I'm cleaning house, I'm putting stuff at the top of the stairs, the bottom of the stairs that need to be returned to the opposite floor. And I never go up and down the stairs without my arms being full of what has to go back to its proper home. So when Paul would come home and he would leap over stuff at the bottom of the stairs on his way upstairs, I would have no positive way to interpret that behavior. I mean, I'd go through, maybe he didn't see it, but obviously he did because he didn't trip on it. Maybe his arms were full. No, 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 he came up empty armed. I would finally default to thinking, He's just trying to ruin my life. There can be no other explanation for this until I understood the temperament piece. And Paul, as that very strong visionary, he was already up the stairs. He saw what was at the bottom only to protect his life from tripping on it and dying, but not as something that needed to be moved. And when I found grace that I couldn't, I couldn't celebrate his visionary giftings and damn him at the same time for the back side of it or for the dark side of it. So I really had to just embrace that my strength was order and his strength was vision. And we were going to be better together as a result. And I think that's really the key. I think that's really the key here is that we celebrate the strength of our mate rather than criticize them. Mm -hmm. I am so thankful Virginia is orderly, organized, She knows where to find files, how to file. I love that about her, Uh, but it's not me, but I am creative. And so I don't get upset with her because she can't think up curriculums because that's not her gifting, but also she can't get upset with me that I don't think systematically because that's not how God's wired me. Let us say really quickly here that this is not an excuse for sin. So I can't say that oh, I'm just wired this way, so that's why I'm uh, not considerate, or that's why I'm this or that. But it's just general areas we're talking about. No, that's about. really good. So Shanna and I, we have five in our family. Four of us possess the choleric temperament. So Shanna, I'm choleric, 50% choleric, 50% sanguine. She's 50% choleric, 50% melancholic. So, so we share that choleric box. But the melancholic side of her is wanting order and she wants things to go back where they go. And the sanguine part of me doesn't care. And so that is so celebrating those differences instead of uh, you know, attacking them. For example, when Shanna looks into a ki- the kitchen and she looks at the refrigerator, she sees a bunch of ingredients that could go into a recipe. I see a meal. So when I leave and go on a speaking event, Shanna has popcorn and wine for dinner because she has no way of putting it all together creatively. But she's the greatest, but she's the best baker you've ever been around because she can follow the order. And so to celebrate those things. So you had an application on here that I thought was really good because listening to you guys is really refreshing. Uh, You are an older couple than us. And so you have a cool application at the end of chapter three, I think is is wise for all of us couples to uh, adhere to and to reference. Thank your spouse for a gift, ability, or a character trait that you have little of and they have more of. Say something like, you're so good at blank. I sure am glad I'm married to you. Yeah, I would just say, do you want to start or do you want me to start? I'll start. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. You kind of already said it. Um, but he is very creative when it comes to food. And I am super thankful for that because I would probably starve to death if I were not married. To you. Yep. So You would. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a pretty, I mean, it's minor and seems silly, but it is very significant to me because I like good food and it is important to me that I don't know. It's just been really great to have you take care of that aspect of our family. I would say for you, I appreciate how orderly you are and detail oriented because I don't see the details at all. And so the fact that you can see things in the house 
that need to be fixed or adjusted, or you're able to dive into some deeper areas of our the technical stuff in our house. Um, I really appreciate that because I would that I, that to me that's the bane of my existence. So I'm really thankful that you do that. So anyway, okay. So ch- chapter four is simply titled "Realize That Your Enemy Is Not Your Spouse," and I thought that was so good. I had a dear friend of mine recently said, "Your those people are not your enemy; they're captive." from an enemy this the devil and i don't want to say that that about my wife i'm just saying that my wife is not my enemy you know there is an enemy out there that wants to destroy my marriage and it's not my wife she's she's my ally and she's my best friend and we were driving last night to pick her up my son colton who's my 23 year old said dad can i ask you a question he said what he goes do you love mom more now or or more when years ago how do you how do you love mom more or less i said oh way more he goes, oh, okay, good. That's what I thought. But, but you know, wanting to understand, you know, is is this person that I married my enemy, or did I marry her for a different reason? Can you guys build on that? Yeah, you know, I think when a a couple comes in for us for counseling and we say, "Why are you here?" They um, almost always immediately start shooting the yeah. other person. Well, she, well, she that, and they go at each other. And somewhere during the time, we really try to say, you know, you need to realize there is an enemy that wants to take down your marriage, and that's Satan. And uh, you are not each other's enemy. The enemy is using both of you very effectively, but you're not the enemy. And I know it's difficult to do, but if in the midst of a conflict, you can say, okay, you're not the enemy. We've got to work together to defeat the enemy. I, that's just a helpful mindset to have. And it's funny because it seems like stating the obvious, but when we get in to these places of severe conflict, it really is hard to step back and grant that your mate isn't really the problem or they're not really the enemy. But if we have a real understanding of spiritual warfare and of the battle that we really are in, we have to be convinced that because marriage by design was to reflect the glory of God, the enemy is going to do whatever he can do to de-glorify God, to really take shots at what God wants to accomplish through our marriages. So when we have that in our operating system and we recognize that when we get into turbulent waters, we really have to do what seems counterintuitive at the time the intuitive part wants us to separate from one another, shoot at each other, prove our point, be defensive, whatever. The counterintuitive is to draw together, to be unified, to say, wait, 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 we're going to go down if we don't stand together on this because we've got to be unified in fighting the real enemy. I think that that kind of thinking, the more and more we embrace that, the better prepared we're actually going to be for the battle. An observation was made in Wyoming that when wild wolves are attacking a group of wild horses, the horses all put their heads together and they kick out at the wolves as they come. When those wolves attack donkeys, the donkeys put their heads out towards the wolves and they kick each other. And uh, one is, do we want to be like horses or like jackasses, you know, and uh, what we really need to do is look at the problem and work together uh, and rather than kick each other. So what you're saying to me is if, if I'm if I am doing something wrong, my wife can tell me to stop being an ass. <laughs> uh, you have to put oh, Jack. Okay, ass okay. So I love what you guys wrote here. And you wrote this in this chapter. You said at the end of the day, it is important to remember that it is Satan who is the real enemy in marriage, not one another. Satan uses us against each other effectively at times, but it is all a part of his strategy to steal and kill and destroy our marriages, our relationship with God and us. And that's so powerful in a day when Christian marriages are dissolving and disintegrating and they've we've lost our focus. So what's a great application for couples to reflect on this chapter? Um, We're going to ask you as a couple to make an appointment with a couple who's been married longer than you that you really respect and together ask them five questions regarding what has contributed to the health of their marriage. It's kind of a a mentoring and a session or two 
to get some insight into what was helpful for them as they reached the place in their marriage that's beyond yours. So can you guys think of a clue you could do that with? Well, we're going to think about that yeah. because uh, that's a powerful, okay. that's a powerful uh, question. We actually don't interact with a lot of older couples these days. So that's, you know, really, really mm-hmm. powerful. So maybe Ken and Kathy Watson, because mm-hmm. they're very similar to us. In a lot of ways. So that's really good. I appreciate that. So let, let's dive into chapter five. Keep, this is so, this is so important. So we are rounding the corner on 30 years of marriage. So we're coming up on 29 real fast. And we are, I think we are better than ever. And so, but we've had a lot of our peers their marriages have disintegrated around this time. And when I look back, I think chapter five is huge. I I can't overemphasize this. Keep your marriage a priority. And I see this a lot. This becomes a real problem in second and third marriages when the kids take priority over the marriage. Can you walk us through this chapter? You know, it's interesting when scripture talks about two becoming one, uh, it is husband and wife. This is the only human oneness relationship that we're called to. You are never called to be one with your parents. You are never called to be one with your children, never called to be one with your ministry. And I think often we, uh, Satan is a, a master of distracting us into lots of good things that take us away from our best. Last night, again, we just talked to a a couple, and the gentleman was leaving literally physically his wife to go to another country because he said that's what God wanted him to do, and to do missions in another country. And we just said, no, he's calling you first to love your wife. This is the priority. Uh, And I think Satan uses things like that that are really good. I personally think children are an instrument of Satan. (laughs) That's why we speak together. Let me quickly say what he means is that children can be used by Satan to divide our marriages. Well, yeah, you know, (laughs) you're hugging in the kitchen, and where does that little two-year-old get? Right in between the two of you and pushes you out. And those boogers will keep pushing you apart unless you kick them out of the house, you know. And so obviously we believe in children, we love children, but a lot of, and it's typically wives put their children ahead of their marriage. And and some of them blatantly say that. If I have to choose my children or my marriage, I'm choosing my children. A lot of men will choose their job or their ministry or their hobby and say, you know, I am not going to give up playing golf. And if you don't like it, or we had a doctor say, uh, I can always get a new wife, but I'm not getting another job. And he left his wife. Uh, that is not scriptural. Scriptural all is always the marriage is the primary relationship after the Lord. And the Lord will never take you away from your marriage. Ministry may or the church may, but the Lord will never take you away. That's a powerful, powerful statement that the Lord will never take you away from your marriage. Now, I want you to explain something. On page 107, you made a a short statement. You've briefly explained it, but I want you to address a specific thing. You said right at the middle of the page, in America, we live in a child-centered culture. How is America different from other countries in child rearing? That's a good question, Jim, because we have done quite a bit of work in Africa and Trinidad, some work in Europe and Australia. And I think that there, there is really in America, somehow we have elevated our children to a level of idolatry. And it's come in the form of we've got to give the very best to our children so they're going to have the competitive edge in this culture. And we buy the lie that if we don't have them in T-ball at age four, we've doomed their athletic future. Or if we don't have them in after school programs that are going to increase their math skills and their language skills, that they'll never be able to be competitive in a good college. Or if we don't get them in music lessons or ballet, you just name it. And there's tremendous pressure in our culture on parents to make sure that their children 
are getting the best of everything so that they'll have the best life ever. And unfortunately, social media has amplified the pressure. So we see, we just met with a young couple yesterday. They have an 11 month old and she is feeling the pressure from social media that her child didn't have teeth yet. But all the other mothers who had 11 month old, their kids had teeth. And the comments people would make like, what? She doesn't have teeth? Like, haven't you been rubbing her gums or, you know, get a knife and cut them out there. You gotta have teeth. It's ridiculous. It sounds so crazy, but this is truly what is happening. And as you mentioned it earlier, we call it fake book also, Mm -hmm. that there are just these unrealistic bars that are set of things that we want people to believe about us and we carefully guard everything that we don't want them to believe about us. And I think in this child centric world, it's infected the Christian community. And we feel that somehow, I I think it comes from a well-meaning place of wanting to do the best for our kids, but it very quickly goes upside down and a child centric home is not good for anyone. You know, what's interesting. I walked in on a Bible study with a group of guys uh, years ago now, a couple years ago. And the, the one of the guys who'd been married, he was on his third marriage. He was telling another guy who was on his second marriage, I just told my wife, my kids are more important. And if you don't like it, you can leave. And I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you a Christian? He goes, well, yeah, I'm in a Bible study. I said, your kids are never more important than your wife. And I don't care how many wives. The pro- Maybe the reason you have three wives is because you've never made your wife more important than your kids. And the guy repented instantly, but yeah. there is a mentality out there, especially among second and third marriages, that I'm, it's my kids. And I think they're really wrong here. And so thoughts on that? Well, I think with second and third marriages where you're bringing children in, it does make it really tough because you you internally feel, I let my children down and I've hurt them by the divorce. So now I am going to make sure that I'm there for them. And uh, very easily we elevate them. But again, the greatest gift we can give our children is a strong marriage. And uh, so many children are just fearful their parents are going to get divorced. And I think even your son asking you that question certainly wasn't, Dad, are you going to get divorced? But he's wanting to know, is marriage solid? Is your marriage good? Uh, I think that's down deep, no matter what age our children are, they're concerned about that. Yeah, it was a surprising question. And uh, and I, I sense the fear behind it. And I'm a product of a divorced family. And so I remember the fear of the hearing the parents fight and going, okay, are my parents next on the chopping block? And so, uh, you know, we've been very careful to mm-hmm. let our kids know, hey, this marriage is forever and it's going to be a great marriage and we're deeply, deeply committed. And so do you have an application from your book to help couples keep their marriage a priority? Yes. Um, Be intentional this week in setting time apart for each other in the form of a date night or some other time together. And that application was prompted by the reality that most marriages sort of go into neutral because they're pulled in so many different directions, especially if in their they're raising young children, the demands of that, the demands of ministry, the demands of jobs. And it seems like the marriage easily gets pushed to the back burner, but the health of the marriage affects all of those other areas. So we want you to be intentional in setting aside time for each other, either through a date night, it can be a date breakfast, a date lunch, something that says our marriage is important to carve out time for. You know, it's interesting the entire time of our children's childhood, every Thursday night, we had a date night. And I just want to say that sometimes it was going to Goodwill. Sometimes it was going to Burger King and then going and watching the ocean. Uh, it was, it was, it didn't have to be money related. It was time related. And now that our kids are out of the house, we have to be creative. And I, I'll be, able, I'm really thankful for her because she will tell me, Hey boy, I need you. So like last night we were driving home. She goes, I'm exhausted from work. You are mine this weekend. And so I'm going, okay, great. We're going to go to one of the three restaurants that has dining <laughs> during COVID. <laughs> we're going to go hang out and be together. And so I really yeah. do appreciate that. So that's excellent. So let's move down to chapter six. How are you guys doing? Yeah. Tip, yeah. 
Let me just add one thing to it, and that is put your phones away when you're on your date. This is just epidemic. We see couples that are doing date night, but they're not putting their phones away. And you effectively cancel the date night. We're talking about undivided attention with each other. Okay. That's really good. I have a question. How do you guys separate because you work together, your ministry is together. When you go on a date, how do you not talk about the ministry? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think it's a really tough thing because, uh, we're both passionate about that. So it doesn't feel like work. So, you know, I'm not talking about how to maintain a car or fix something or, uh, and so I think that's the challenge in it, but I, I think we do have to be disciplined to uh, not just make it at a working dinner. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think what Virginia said is so important. Just putting the phones away is a helpful part of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just saying, we're not going to talk about, the ministry during this this meal. We're going to talk about what are some of our dreams for an vacation or what do we think about for retirement or whatever the issue is, but we're not going to talk about ministry. Yeah, I think you're going to have to be pretty intentional. I would not say that we're the poster children of success in that, to be really honest with you. Or I think that's intertwined in your daily life, you know, yeah. hard. Exactly. It really is because it's kind of what we do live and breathe. We love what we do. We love the people we do it with. But I will I will say we have to be pretty intentional to not let that just consume us 24-7. And it's just hard. Those are hard boundaries to keep, but worth fighting for. So here's a question for you. <clears throat> I think I'm better than you at compartmentalizing work. And now that you're working for me, I feel like you're weaving everything in together since you're more network focused with your mind. Do you think that you're the bigger violator of this or me? Well, yeah, I obviously, yes. <laughs> but I also think part of that reason is because when I'm away, I can't nail you down for those questions. Whereas when we're in bed or having coffee in the morning, you're there and I can nail you down for those questions. So, I, yes. I love it when we're in bed and you want to talk about work stuff. That's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So, hey, speaking of, speaking of the bedroom, I, I want to talk about chapter six. I, I just think these chapters are beautiful. They build on each other. And man, if, if, you know, we're our target audience, Paul and Virginia, are men who are living in a stress bubble. They're 25 to 50. Their kids are in the home. They're working a job. They're driving to work. They're trying to serve in their churches. They're trying to serve in their community. They're coaching their kids' sports teams. And, and these guys are, are very, very busy. And this is, but this is so critical. Talk to us about your chapter titled, Be Intentional in Pursuing One Another. And I will add a quote. Uh, you've highlighted this quote, and I just love this quote. And I want you to explain the chapter in this quote. You can't please and love your spouse if you don't know your spouse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. It's a great, great quote. I, uh, what book was that from? Uh, <laughs> well, I think often, <laughs> we'll buy it I think today. Often, <laughs> I think often we feel uh, if I like it, she should like it. And even when we do a date or go to a restaurant or a movie or whatever it is, uh, we're doing what we want to do. And I think the first part of sacrificial love is really knowing your spouse, knowing what it is they like and what it is that's important to them, and then doing that for them. It really fits into what I said earlier that it's not about logic, it's about love. Uh, Even while we're in Hawaii, uh, Virginia loves sunsets. So we're doing counseling, but we counsel for the afternoon, then we take a two-hour break which is sunset break, and then we counsel again. Now, frankly, if I were doing it, I would just go straight through. I mean, the sun sets every night, so who cares if you miss a few? But that's just a way of knowing, Virginia, that that's important, and so you do it because you love your wife. And I think, again, if you think premaritally, if people look backwards, we can all tap into remembering how exciting it was to discover each other there, there weren't enough questions we could ask. There weren't enough observations we could make as we were 
finding out about this person we were falling in love with. We just feel like we have to be very intentional once we're married to continue to pursue knowing and understanding the person we're married to because the information that we brought into marriage isn't stagnant. It's not necessarily going to stay exactly that same for all the rest of our days. So it's an ongoing process of understanding, of learning, of knowing, of pursuing, of paying attention to, of being intentional about that. I speak with more wives who feel like their husbands checked out on them not too long after they walked down the aisle, sort of like, okay, we got married. So now, now we just do life. And they, these women often feel neglected. They feel like their husband really ceased paying attention to them or caring about them. And that the only real interest their husband has in them comes in the bedroom. And I want, I just want to tell you the context of a wife feeling neglected and ignored is not a good setup for the bedroom. Absolutely not. Well, you know, it's really interesting, you guys. When we first got married, uh, we might have been dating. It was Valentine's, and I bought her a dozen roses. I thought, man, I have just hit the ball out of the park. And she said, these are beautiful, but in the future, can you spend money on something creative or something that's not generic? And it was really interesting because for the first 20 years of our marriage, she would get really upset, and the house being clean was a really big deal. And I, I couldn't figure out what the what the deal was with that, and I and I realized she loved rubbing, having me rub her feet. So I thought, oh, her love language is physical touch. Love, I rub her feet, and just the world unlocked for me. And I realized that the house being cleaned and the foot rubbing, they were they were the same thing. That her her love language is acts of service. So when I'm rubbing her feet, it's not about the physical touch. It's like I'm serving her. When I pick her up at the airport, I'm serving her. When I clean up the house, it's me loving her and serving her. And I realized that I needed to love my wife according to her love language. Because when I was trying to love her according to my love language, like with words of affirmations, I, I keep all, every part I ever get, I put it in my books. I use it for bookmarks. She does not care about words of affirmations. Just serve me. Oh, well, yes, I do. <laughs> Do you? You're <laughs> awful, baby. You're so pretty. <laughs> Everybody wants well, to be. You know, we're, we're exactly the same as you are. Uh, I am a words of affirmation and a physical touch. I'm bilingual. Uh, but <laughs> Virginia is active service. And so when Virginia travels uh, to speak at, say, a women's conference, I'll put notes in her suitcase. I love you. You're beautiful. You're going to do a great job. You know, all this. And it really means nothing to her. It's sort of like, will the house be clean when I come home? You know, that's the real issue. And it's it's knowing each other. You know, in John 13, after Jesus in the upper room, he says to the disciples, now that you know these things, you will be blessed. And then he has those last four words, if you do them. And I think even some of us know our spouse, but we just refuse to do it. I know she likes this, but I'm not going to do it. Or I know he'd appreciate that. That's not going to happen. Or we get complacent and it just doesn't happen. Well, I just think we just easily default to our mother tongue, right? So mm -hmm. acts of service is my primary love language. So I'll serve Paul all day long. And at the end of it, he'll say, but do you really love me? And I'll say, of course I love you. Haven't you seen all the things I've done for you? And he'll say, yeah, but you haven't really said that you love me. You haven't really told me how great I am. And I, I'm sort of like, words are cheap. Anybody could say anything. Real love is action. But for a words of affirmation person, those words are very, very important. Yeah. Well, and all those times when, when Paul would hurdle the clothes and run up the stairs, you're feeling less loved for that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it's very easy for me to say, what's wrong with you? Like, do you have eyes? Can you see? Are, why don't you pick up the things that makes me feel like you're just lazy? So especially for a words of affirmation person, those words of criticism cut really deep. And they, they're not inconsequential. They feel really hurtful. Well, and we want to tell our, hey, guys, you guys listen to this po podcast episode right now. If you go to episode 344 and 360, 
you can hear two interviews with our friend Gary Chapman, who is the author of the book, The Five Love Languages. Uh, that'll really help you in loving your wife better. Hey, number seven, give each other love and respect. I love this. Uh, Emerson Egrix uh, wrote a great book on the title. I think this is so powerful. And you've already touched on this a little bit, but do you want to add anything? Well, I think what we'd like to add is that when we look at this, we go back to Genesis, that in Genesis uh, 3.16, it says, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. And because of the fall, women have a natural desire uh, to tell their husband how they could do it better, why they did it this way. And, And that's because they were designed to be helpers. But after the fall, they became a little bit of controllers. So that the word desire there in Genesis 3.16 actually is unpacked in the meaning of a tendency to control, to manipulate, to undermine, to overrule. So the dynamic, the backdrop for that is that there's a corruption of power between husbands and wives, and each will try to kind of control or manipulate the other. So when you come to this Ephesians 5 passage, it's really addressing the impact of the fall, which naturally predisposes us not to cooperate, but to compete. So we just feel this is, this is the root in most marriages that is either going to trip you up and make you fall, or when you get this right, it's going to really enhance your marriage and allow you then to be a cooperative, strong force together. It's huge. The number one the number one phrase that women says is I was just trying to help. And the number one phrase men say is all I want you to be is happy. And uh, when we talk that through and understand that that's part of our DNA, uh, it helps us a huge amount. Well, you know, it's interesting, Paul. The first time I heard this was at Family Camp 2000. And I think you and Virginia were actually speaking on this topic. And I realized Oh, your desire will be to control. And it's really interesting. So we're talking love and respect. So you've got to go back to Emerson Egrix, right? In his book, he said something interesting with Ephesians chapter five. He said, God, I think it's five times in that passage, asks men to love their wives. Women are never told not one time to love their husbands. And and Emer- Egrix explains that a man's default is respect. He doesn't naturally love. So God asks a man to do what doesn't come natural to love. A woman's default is love and her, but she doesn't default to respect. Respect is difficult. And so he asks her to do what is difficult. So God in his, his ingenuity asked the man to do what was difficult and the woman to do what was difficult. So the two could serve each other. That's so powerful. Because Ephesians 5 is actually the antidote to the fall. Because of the fall, Virginia's tendency is going to be to control me. Because of the fall, my tendency is going to be either to abdicate leadership or dominate. Ephesians 5 says, no, don't control him, love him, submit to him. Don't uh, dominate her, love her as Christ loved the church. So good. Do you have an application for chapter 7? Yeah, for each one of you, um, men, surprise your wife this week by doing something for her or with her that you know would mean a lot to her, but that you normally wouldn't do. So love her, cherish her. And women, this week, focus on affirming your husband and refraining from correcting him or instructing him on how he could have done it better. <laughs> oh, that's what. Okay. So we'll have to work on that one. You get to affirm me. Okay. I love that. And I'll do something unique and special. You did it last <laughs> night. Oh, you giving me a pass? Yeah. She just gave me a free pass. She's awesome. We heard her. <laughs> uh, we heard her live. Okay, so chapter eight, experience. This is this really could be the sentence to describe the whole book. Experience the joy of sacrificial love. Can you explain? Well, when, this goes when you know your spouse's needs and desires and you put those ahead of your own, uh, sacrifice and love really go together. The greatest, uh, uh, the greatest expression, of love. <laughs> excuse me. the greatest uh, expression of love was Jesus' death on the cross. And in a marriage relationship, 
here in Hawaii a number of years ago. I love the jacuzzis. Virginia hates them. She thinks it's a big bathtub that people have been doing who knows what in. And so she doesn't like them. I love them. But I'm in a jacuzzi by myself here in Hawaii. She comes and sits next to me. And now when she did that, I knew it wasn't because she liked jacuzzis all of a sudden. She was saying, I love you and I know you love this. I'm going to do this. So it's knowing your spouse and then doing that, which is important to them. And you've said it well, Jim. It's really the theme that runs throughout the book. This is counter fallen human nature. Human nature propels me to do what I want to do. That requires no sacrifice, right? That's just an indulgence of my own pleasure. Godly Christian marriages that are set apart are ones which really embrace sacrificial love. I'm not living for myself. I'm doing this for you, Jesus, by loving my mate well, by, by denying myself. This isn't all about me. It really is about choosing to lay down my life for my mate. And it can be in just very, very small ways to very large ways. The small ways actually make probably the bigger difference over the long haul. So powerful. Do you have an application in this chapter? Yes. Yeah, so before you leave the house each day, ask each other if there is something you could do for your mate that would make their day go more easily and then do it. So just come alongside each other. Is there something I could do for you today? Hmm. I could think of lots of things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you get one because then I get one. No, I just want to hang out later. Hang out later. Work out. Okay, mm-hmm. but I have a board meeting at five, so right. so work out before that. Yep. Okay, you got it. I've already me? got the workout on the board. Uh, help me buy <laughs> dinners for the board guys at Sandwich Express. Okay. All right, deal. All right, that was fun. We got that one. That was pretty easy. When she's your workout partner, it's easy to, her, to work out with her. So, so yeah. chapter nine. Chapter nine is called. Uh, I hate saying chapter nine is called because really I feel like these are 10 marriage commandments, you know, find new life through forgiveness. And, and I I just, you know, I go back to a quote by Leonard Smeads and he said to forgive someone is to set a prisoner free only to realize that that prisoner is you. And there's something so powerful in forgiveness. And I think sometimes as followers of Jesus, we somehow leave that out and think it's okay to struggle through bitterness and resentment. Can you help us understand why this is so important in a marriage? Well, if we don't forgive, we just keep building on rubble, if you will. We use the example that when a house collapses, you have three options. Walk away, act like it didn't happen and build on it, or clean the rubble. Clearing the rubble is asking forgiveness, confession with each other. We ask couples to do the confession exercise. It's make a list of ways that you have wronged your spouse, not that they've wronged you, that you have wronged your spouse, and then ask them for forgiveness. Uh, That's getting rid of the rubble. And uh, when you do that, we find couple after couple is really their marriages are rejuvenated by that because they are saying, please forgive me. I was short with you last night, or I you know, did this or that. And when we clear that out, uh, we can build on a solid foundation. Mm. Yeah, I think the enemy really has a lot of play in this area that unforgiveness makes us angry, bitter, vindictive people. We keep scores and all of the rest. And the enemy just has us exactly where he wants us when that is what marks our marriage. We're a very angry people overall. And I think a lot of it has its roots in unforgiveness. I think we've bought several lies about forgiveness. One is that if, if our mate doesn't tell confess, then we don't have to forgive them. And it becomes this economy that makes sense, but not in God's economy. When Jesus hung on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So the more I keep score on my mate, the more distance there's going to be between us. So we really feel strongly that just keeping a short accounts, going to the foot of the cross. And when you confess, include no buts in the confession. We often will say, I mean, I'm really sorry that I lost my temper and yelled at you. I shouldn't have called you that name. But if you, and the minute that but comes in, we've effectively canceled so, the forgive. We've, we've canceled the confession. 
and we really haven't at all. And then it just continues to build inside of us, separating us. This is huge. Well, you in your book, you called forgiveness the sacrifice that brings life. And I think that's powerful. You said as image bearers of Christ, we are never more Christ-like than when we forgive. The ultimate expression of love from Christ was when his sacrificial death on the cross was his sacrificial death on the cross so that we could be reconciled to God. And I think I think that's powerful that asking for forgiveness is a sacrifice of love on our part. So do you have an application for that? Yeah. Um, Each of you take some time to write down the areas in which you feel you have hurt your mate and you need to ask for forgiveness. Oh, that's oh, an, an easy one. Finally. You may want it <laughs> offline. That's not how we do our marriage. So I can go first. Do you want me to go first? Okay. So I, um, I have, I feel like I fail, like I fail you in vilifying you in front of the kids instead of honoring you in front of the kids. And I've already told you this before, but I do, I I need you to forgive me for that. And I'm working on not vilifying you, but honoring you. And I sometimes fail in that area horribly. So I do want you to forgive me in that area. Okay. Okay. That's my biggest mistake in my marriage. Mm -hmm. Um, Gosh, I'm. It's hard for me to think of something I do wrong. <laughs> I mean, to whittle it down to a hundred is it must. I don't know how you do it. My one came up easy. You're a hundred. I don't know. Um, well, I definitely. Um, I need to work on respecting and affirming you more, and I know that. I need to be affirmed. I know. Just tell me I'm awesome. I know. You're awesome. But she doesn't want to lie either. So. <laughs> Hey, hold on a second. I think it's okay if it's the, the end is better than the means. I'm just kidding. No, but it's, it's really funny. It's funny that it's funny because words of affirmation is not her love language. It's acts of service. So for her, uh, when she writes a birthday card to me and she says something really heartfelt, it just ministers to me. And I know that it was difficult for her because it's not her thing. It's just not how she does it. And so for her, I, I need to know, like I tell people, the, when we launched this ministry, about two months after we launched it, we almost went, we went into foreclosure. We almost lost a house. We had no money. But, but she became a hero to me because we had family breakfast together. We used to eat breakfast as a family every morning. And I, w- I was getting ready to launch this ministry. And as I shared the vision for the family and the fear and the trepidation and the potential disaster, my wife said in front of the kids, I have trusted you for 20 years and you've never let me down. I'll keep trusting you. That was huge. Wow. Yeah. I needed that. Yeah. 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 That's great. So, okay. So we're going to move on. So I really want to encourage you guys listening right now. You need to sit down with your wife. I think this might be the most powerful application of the book that you ask each other for forgiveness there's humility involved there's pride involved there's release involved there's bondage involved and guys you just need to do it so hey let's move on to chapter 10 and man once you get to chapter 9 chapter 10 is fun and basically this is just delight in each other what did you, why did you save that one for the last i think because it's really easy to lose the delight and the joy in marriage when we get so weighed down with all the responsibility and all of the people that are depending on us and all of the demands and life can be serious and i mean we all know we've just been through the difficult most difficult year for most of us in all of our existence between covid racial tensions and the election it's just been heavy mm-hmm. there's just been a tremendous amount of of sadness all around us to be honest and it's just so easy for us to forget to enjoy the journey with each other and every once in a while i'll just look at paul and think i get to do life with this remarkable person i wish that that dominated my thoughts all the time but it honestly doesn't there are plenty of times i'm distracted by everything else (laughs) that we have to do etc etc but 
when we're walking on the beach, we actually walk together five miles every single day. And those that has just actually really served our marriage well as a place of connection and remembering our delight. And But again, delighting, it seems crazy to have to say, be intentional about enjoying the journey and finding delight. But I think it's actually true. Paul, I got to tell you, all Paul is thinking right now is, she just called me a remarkable person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, do you have anything uh, to add? No, she said it all. That's, that's great. <laughs> well, you know, I love what you guys wrote in the book. Very simply, you said, love always does what is best and most pleasing for our spouse. And if we can look our spouse in the eye and say, I love you, then we also need to realize how important that is. So do you have an application at the end of chapter 10? Yeah, we want each of you to write a note or post it to each other and hide it so that your mate will find it at some point during the day. And on that note, finish the sentence, I delight in being married to you because, and then write a statement. Okay, so we're doing this live. So so yep. I delight in you because. So do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? I delight in you. You look me in the eye when you say it. I delight in <laughs> you. You because you are creative and you are a goal setter and in your creativity you create goals and that's just not who I am. So I appreciate that. Um I delight in you in the last three years because of your strength. You are such a badass. <laughs> I mean, you are a warrior, and I just uh I've really come to appreciate your strength in the last three years, watching you thrive as a flight attendant. So, yeah. So, yeah. Just because I'm gone three or four days a week. I get a binge watch. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh, hey, guys, you guys listening to the show right now, man, what are your boots on the ground? What action items are you going to take because of this great podcast? Guys, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back through the podcast if you haven't taken notes and take notes on these applications or you can do like john rogers down in atascadero california who sent me an email today saying because of you i've had to buy a lot of books so you can go pick this book up it's a great book paul and virginia where can they pick this book up they can pick it up on amazon or uh if you go to our website himweb.org, H-I-M-W-E-B.org, and uh, put in, when you check out, put in the the code ARENA. We will give you 50% off on the book for the month of March. That is so great, you guys. The guys, again, the book is called The Marriage App, Unlocking the Irony of Intimacy. You get a 50% off if you type in ARENA to the code on their website, which is him web. web. Dot org. I'm so glad I'm married to a details person. Paul or Virginia, thank you guys so much for coming on our show. It's so fun and such an honor to be with you guys. Oh, thank thanks you. so much. We've loved it. The honor That's is ours. <laughs> hey, until next time, feel the wet sand on the arena floor. Hear the deafening roar of the crowd. Taste the sweetness of victory. Smell the stench of battle. Get in the game, get dirty, grind it out, and be a man. Do you want to say it? (laughs) You should be a man. Be a man. (laughs) Okay. You've been listening to the Men in the Arena podcast. If you hunger to be your best version, then join thousands of men from around the world in our Men in the Arena forum on Facebook. This is the best place to have open discussions around the topic of biblical manhood. Make sure to explore our website at meninthearena.org, sign up for the weekly equipping blast, and take advantage of our many free resources designed to help you become your best version of a man. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Men in the Arena podcast. Remember, when a man gets it, Everyone wins.